Folks, churches are under attack, not just by big cities, but by little cities, little towns, not just on the East Coast or the West Coast, but in the middle America, the Midwestern part of America, churches are under attack. We're going to talk about a very important case that could impact many churches across the country in the second half of the show. But in the first half of the show, I want to talk about something very positive that we're seeing spreading across America, and it's an organization. It's called Trail of Life USA. We're going to talk to the director of that uh, program, Mark Hancock. Mark, thank you for being on the show. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Now, Mark, first let's talk about why there is the Trail of Life, because you guys are a lot like the Boy Scouts, and yet there's been some changes in the Boy Scouts that have caused so many people to leave the Boy Scouts and to join your organization, your ministry, uh, to, uh, to young men. What happened with the Boy Scouts? Well, in 2013, the Boy Scouts started talking about making some major changes in their membership standards. And uh, churches, we realized that churches just weren't going to be able to tolerate that because it was going to be going against a lot of the, uh, the theological standings of churches, particularly in the area of the definition of, of, um, of marriage or the definition of sexuality or, or, or what makes uh, somebody uniquely male and female. Right. And so uh, there were about 300 volunteers across the country uh, organized and began to look at alternatives to Boy Scouts that would provide a more traditional uh, biblical uh, program but that would still embrace some of the ideals that made, that made uh, Boy Scouts a great organization in terms of character, development, leadership, adventure opportunities. And so Trail Life USA was, was launched on January 1st, 2014. Now, Mark, I, I understand that the Boy Scouts, first they, they talked about you know, kids who could join the Boy Scouts uh, and dealing with those who had you know, sexual orientation issues. And I, I wasn't, that wasn't so much of an issue to me because the Boy Scouts is a part of that helping young boys uh, you know, affirm their, their, their manhood, becoming men, young men, and dealing with these issues that are not that uncommon in early adolescence. But then they took it farther, and they, they, they decided to allow leaders, scout leaders that are taking these boys up in the mountains uh, on these, these trips, overnight trips, that uh, had sexual attraction to the same sex, spending the night up there in the mountains. I just would find that very discomforting, and particularly just like a man taking a bunch of teenage girls up in the mountains. By, you know, I, I would find that disturbing as well. Well, the Boy Scouts allowed that, and then I understand they started allowing girls to join the Boy Scouts, which really sort of muddied the purpose of the Boy Scouts, which is to help young boys become young men and working through their their, their, their manhood and, and what it means to be a man and, and having their own confidence and being able to, uh, to do things and to accomplish things. Uh, I think that's, there's Girl Scouts. I think it's good for Girl Scouts. They, they, you know, but for the Boy Scouts to allow this to come in, um, I think only allows more confusion and, and misunderstandings. So they really went a very uh, unorthodox route. People like me, a former Boy Scout, I was very disturbed by that, very disappointed. And yet, we now have something very positive, and you decided, instead of just complaining, you and others decided to do something about it. You formed the, this wonderful organization called Trail, of, uh, you know, Trail Life USA. Now, how is it different than the traditional Boy Scouts, or is it, is it different? Well, that's a great question, and I suppose that if you looked at us, uh, if you took a quick look at us, you would say, well, this looks a lot like Boy Scouts. There are troops that have uh, boys and adult leaders, and they're going out doing things like camping and hiking and adventures kind of things. Uh, they're, they're organized in troops that meet on a weekly basis and, and do these types of activities. There's a robust awards program. There's uniforms and handbooks and, and guides and all those things involved. But the real critical differences are what makes us uh, unique and makes us uh, totally different from the Boy Scouts. And that's two main things I can point to. One is that we're Christ-centered. We're unapologetically Christian and Christ-centered, which means that that we embrace and adhere to uh, biblical principles and definitions of marriage and sexuality and those types types of things. And secondly, we're boy-focused. As you mentioned, the Boy Boy Scouts have kind of left that area. They've they've embraced this politically correct 
uh, dogma that says that boys and girls are essentially the same. We just don't believe that. We, right. we, we, we know it's not politically correct, but we think boys and girls are different. So we have a program that is designed specifically for boys, and it encourages uh, male uh, discipleship and mentorship. And uh, so, so that, that, that's a key difference. I mean, you, oh, can yeah. say they, you can say they look the same, but at our core, uh, we're not an outdoor program that's kind of having a Christian experience. At our core, we are a, a Christian organization with traditional biblical values that uses the outdoors and awards and programming such as like that, that to, to, to raise uh, courageous men. Now, you're in, you have churches that sponsor these, these chapters, which I think is great. So if a chapter goes off kilter, the church can blow the whistle, I guess, and, and hold them to some degree accountable to, for, to a, a biblical worldview. Is that sort of why you chose the churches? Yeah, and it's kind of a different model than the Boy Scouts, where Boy Scouts, uh, it's just about anybody could charter a troop. You could have a uh, plumber or a mechanic or, uh, you know, in any sort of organization, a Lions Club or whatever. But with Trail Life USA, we specifically charter with uh, organizations that have a Christian statement of faith and that also agree with our statement of values. And in uh, less than five years, we've had over 800 churches in 50 states, almost 27,000 members who have embraced that as being important and critical to, 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 boys, uh, to boys finding a great place to, to, be, to be raised. And so, the, so yeah, we do, we do partner with a local church, and we consider ourselves partners. Um, we consider ourselves an outreach of that church rather than just a building uh, that we meet in. We consider ourselves partners with that, that local church. Right. So I understand, therefore, that you know, the leadership has to be solid in their, their Christian beliefs and uh, and the, their way of living and their, their life and their role models. What about the kids? I mean, let's say you've got a kid who comes from a family that is, is not religious. They, they want to join their friend. Uh, Bob, Bobby said, hey, join, the, you know, join the, uh, this wonderful organization. And they don't go to church. They're not necessarily a Christian, but, but they, they're drawn to it. Uh, could they join or do they have to have already uh, you know, become a Christian and affirm the Christian faith? Well, that's a great point. We have, we have a, a membership standards for youth and separate men- membership standards for our adults. All of our adults uh, sign a statement of faith and agree to live according to the statement of values, and they also are back- criminal background checked, and they complete uh, child safety youth protection training, all Good. of our adults, of Good. our 9,000 9, volunteer adults across the country. Excellent. And when it comes to boys, we have a very inclusive policy. Boys can be of any faith or no faith at all in being in the program. In fact, our, our, our part of our, our vision and what it is we're creating is a program that's so excellent that uh, parents who may say, well, we're not particularly religious, but we're going to put our kids in that uh, Montessori school or they're, they're that Catholic school because it gives a good education, we're this, this same sort of thing in Trail Life USA where parents will say, you know, we're not a religious family, but we want our boys in a program that's teaching excellent morals, excellent values. We understand that that's a Christian program, but, but the values being taught there are so close to what we align with, uh, even though we may not be quote-unquote religious. The example we use is like carrot cake. And if you get a piece of carrot cake, there's carrot infused through that entire cake. You cannot miss carrot. You can't take a bite without getting carrot. But you're not going to find big chunks of carrot in there. And that's kind of how uh, our, our Christ-like, our, our, our Christ-centered um, uh uh, piece works in, in our program is it's, it's infused throughout the entire program, but it's not going to be so offensive to somebody who, who doesn't have right. a, a specifically Christian value. But but they can be part of it and and embrace those values and understand that those are traditional values that have served us well uh, for, yeah. for hundreds, not thousands of years. Right. And so so but but we are unapologetically Christian. There's, there's no question yeah. that there's carrot in every bite. Right. But it's not going to be these big offensive pieces. Now, Mark, we have just a little bit of time left, but I, if, if people, the reason I had you, you on this interview for this program is I see so much potential throughout the United States. There's so many people who still don't know about you guys and what you're doing, yet you're established, you're proven. If people want to become a, start one of these in their church, um, or they, they're, they're, they have a child and they want their child to get involved, where do they go? This is a great ministry opportunity. Um, I like people to know exactly how they can become a, uh, a part of this. What website, what phone number, where should they go? They can go to Trail Life USA. That's Trail Life USA, two L's in the middle, 
trailoffusa.com, and there's a tab there to find or start a troop. You can find a troop, you put in your zip code and put in how many miles you're willing to try to travel, and it'll tell you all the troops that are organized in your area. And if there's not one, uh, then you can start a troop, and that's on that same tab, and it walks you through the process of how it is that you can start a troop. Now, right now on the website, if you scroll down to the blog, there's a blog title called Let Boys Be Boys, and that lets you download for free the ebook that we've just released called Let Boys Be Boys. And in there, you can kind of uh, pick up our, our, our philosophy uh, towards boys and how, how critical it is that we have programs that are specifically uh, aimed at boys. So I'd encourage your, your listeners to, to check out the website. Great. Once again, that website is? TrailLifeUSA.com. 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 Folks, this is just another opportunity uh, to minister to young kids and for your church to reach out to your to your community and uh, to be a salt and light. So, Mark, keep up the great work. And if we can ever serve you at the Pacific Justice Institute, just always feel free to give us a call. We love to serve a wonderful ministry is doing great work like you guys across the country. God bless. God bless you. We appreciate the work you all have done. Thank you. For too long, the federal government has used the power of the state as a weapon against people of faith, bullying and even punishing Americans for following their religious beliefs. That is why I am signing today an executive order to defend the freedom of religion and speech. The First Amendment was not written to protect people and their laws from religious values. It was written to protect those values from government tyranny. What our forefathers began, we must work to fulfill. It is the vision of one nation under God where men can live together as brothers in freedom. Officers in Portland, Oregon confronted thousands of protesters in what police called a riot. The company later claimed that they received so many complaints, including a threat for the religious imagery, the billboards ultimately had to be removed. A Rockland Academy teacher was reading books on transgender identity in a kindergarten classroom. For my daughter, having that book read and then seeing her little friend go into a bathroom change clothes and come out, in her five-year-old brain, she thought, oh my goodness, all I have to do to change into a boy is to change my clothes. I don't think you should speak, but it, that doesn't really comport with the First Amendment. I don't care. I don't think that's a like relevant document right now. When I was uh, out there preaching, it was in front of a gas station. People didn't like the message and they called the police. The police officer came and he had the handcuffs, so he put the handcuff on me. Hey, I'm here with our client. Uh, James Denton, uh, who is a street preacher, who was boldly preaching the Word of God, um, sharing the, the hope in Christ, and he was arrested and was being and has been criminally prosecuted. Uh, we just got out of a hearing. I represented him, and uh, we're hopeful that the district attorney is going to drop uh, the case and allow the case to be dismissed. Right. James, uh, thank you for allowing us to represent you. It's been a real privilege. Hundreds of people lining up to light up in California, long lines wrapping around marijuana dispensaries. Across the street from the church and a block away from the preschool is certainly not where the apothecarium's proposed MMD would have the least impact on children. But parental involvement necessitates parental trust. And that parental trust comes through policies and ordinances that are adopted by school boards. A bill that would ban so-called conversion therapy by counseling professionals in California is one step closer to becoming a law. A hearing on the bill drew a lot of people in Sacramento. The proposal would make it illegal for someone to profit if they tried to change someone's sexual orientation. Unlike the previous law, this bill stretches far beyond licensed mental health professionals. It reaches religious ministries engaged in SOCH if there is an exchange of money. For example, paying for a religious retreat, a workbook, or a seminar. That's one of the stipulations they told me that I can't talk to strangers about God. They would take our rights away in a heartbeat without organizations like Pacific Justice. You, know, you can come to them all anytime you want, talk about whatever you want, but you can't talk about God. You know, when you do, we're going to arrest you. Um, I, thought I, was, I thought it was it. I thought it was a dead end. I thought I had no other options. Uh, until PGI uh, stepped in and, and said, no, that's, that's not the case, you do have options. So it's really important, I think, that organizations like Pacific Justice Institute are out there to, to advocate for, for 
the freedom of religion, for the freedom of speech. I, um, I loved working with the Pacific Justice Institute because I felt like they had my same heart. I'm thankful to God for using the Pacific Justice Institute to keep me out there preaching the Word of God. There are people um, like us, we're not lawyers. And I mean, what they did in a matter of days would have taken me probably weeks. And to have an organization like that, that is free of charge, that we didn't have to pay anything to, that's invaluable. You and I have known each other for a long time. Yes. I have great respect for your work. You go into the legal arena to fight for people whose rights are being trampled. Brad, I think you're doing the Lord's work in the devil's territory, and I cannot thank you enough. And the Pacific Justice Institute is uh, absolutely doing great work. Uh, And folks, if you'd like to support the Pacific Justice Institute, become an actual part of our team, it's easy to do. Just simply go to our website, pji.org, pji.org. And there you can sign up uh, to support our work on either a one-time or a monthly basis. We greatly appreciate those of you who choose to become a regular monthly supporter of our work. In any amount, folks, it really adds up and it really means a lot to us and the work that we're doing. Also, while you're there at our website, you can actually sign up to get a copy of the Legal Insider. Uh, this is every week. We send this out and it's an update on our cases, what's actually taking place. A lot of this, folks, you're not going to see this covered in the media. Uh, the media news media doesn't want to cover the successes that we're making in the court for people with regard to the religious freedom, parental rights, sanctity of life, and, and free speech, and these kinds of issues. So uh, go to our website. It's pji.org, pji.org. And once again, you can sign up to become an actual part of our team, and you can also take a look at our resources uh, and also sign up to become a part of the recipients of those who get our Legal Insider. You'll really uh, enjoy lo learning about that and also praying for our work as you stay informed. Now, we have with us on the line one of our attorneys, our full-time attorneys on staff out of our Sacramento, California office, Matt McReynolds. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brad. Always great to be on. Now, Matt, there is a very important case that we're handling out of Wisconsin, DuPere, Wisconsin, that people need to be aware of. I know we cover this in our Legal Insider, but a lot of people aren't aware of this, and yet it's a case that can have a big impact on churches and in re religious institutions and how they govern themselves, we're talking about a city who's passed an ordinance that has the impact of dictating to them uh, with regards to who they can hire, how they can uh, carry out the hiring. But I want to just start off with this question, and that is, what is so bad uh, about a city coming in and telling a church uh, who they can hire, and the fact that they can't discriminate. What's what's wrong with the city making this uh, benevolent, uh, humane mandate upon religious institutions that presumably should be already not discriminating and being compassionate? What's What, what say you? Well, Brad, on the surface, uh, certainly there's an appeal to all of us. We, we want our churches, we want ourselves to be um, the people who, who don't discriminate, people who are fair and who are honest. The problem when you're talking about these types of ordinances and faith-based institutions is that they're actually an attempt to inject a, a whole different type of values into an organization that are often antithetical to what that organization is all about. And particularly, Brad, when we're talking about um, sexual ethics, what the Bible teaches versus what our uh, culture is pushing. Now, what's wrong with this, this public accommodation mandate? It specifically, I understand it deals with uh, you know, sexual orientation, uh, same-sex marriage. Um, I mean, 
obviously there's a lot of religious institutions, a lot of churches that have clear biblical uh, positions on this. And yet, as I understand it, this, this new ordinance is actually telling churches that if they have someone working for their staff, on their staff, who is engaging in sexual relationships like this that violate the church's beliefs and moral values, that there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, am, I mis- am I misreading this? Uh, not at all, Brad. And a perfect example of this that has come to us real recently um, from a different, uh, a different client, different place that's facing a, a real challenge right now. Uh, there's a Christian university that we have been uh, ad- advising. Um, I won't mention uh, the part of the country where it is, but it, they have recently uh, f- been forced to hire someone who has actually turned out to be heavily involved in, in voodoo, a voodoo priest. A voodoo a priest? A voodoo priest at a Christian university. And when the Christian university found out about that, they said, you know, this is, this is clearly not going to work. We can't have that kind of, of spirit and the occult in the middle of our Christian university. <laughs> yeah. And the thinking behind these types of anti-discrimination uh, in employment uh, statutes, Brad, is that a Christian university, or in this case a church, shouldn't be able to make those kinds of spiritual decisions unless the person is actually a minister. If they are, say, in the the church business office or the church administrative office or in any number of other places, the, the city is saying and other jurisdictions are starting to say the church should not be able to have the option even to exclude someone from their employment who is a an avowed practicing voodoo priest. It, it's just crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. And, and the idea that a church uh, is only spiritual or religious with regards to clergy, and that everyone else working for the church uh, has nothing to do with regards to the relationship with God or spiritual uh, spirituality or anything like that, that's, that's crazy. I mean, the, the function of a church is the function of the body of Christ— and the working of the body of Christ together, that's how a healthy church functions. You want people on the same team who are united in purpose, united in calling. And to say, well, some people aren't religious enough in their job, so therefore uh, they can uh, be uh, openly uh, pr- protected to openly in- engaging in a lifestyle that is completely an- an abominable to the teachings of that faith and-, and those beliefs. I think that's crazy. And yet the city of Dupere is doing this and has, an, has enacted this ordinance against the, the churches, actually a Christian radio station. I know we're representing also. Uh, and yet, they knew what they were doing. We put them on, on notice. We at Pacific Justice Institute, and they still decided to carry this out. Are the people there did that um, just unaware, or are they that uh, against, hostile to, to religious institutions, as I know we have more and more in some cities across the country? How do, how do we explain this? Uh, well, Brad, I think it's just um, you know a real problem that we see in, in jurisdictions all across America now, where the government just believes that they know better than the church does, and they just cannot um, take their their hands off of the churches and the religious institutions that continue to do amazing work in our communities, mm. continue to open up their facilities for all kinds of community events, and in this case, Brad, they're actually causing the churches to have to rethink that uh, until um, we can prevail in this lawsuit, as we uh, certainly hope uh, and pray that, that we do. Uh, the churches have actually had to consider scaling back some of their uh, community outreach, some of their availability to the community because of what the city is doing. Now, I understand that the city of Pair has decided to pronounce uh, amidst this, this ordinance what they feel is the, quote, proper role of churches. Uh, tell me about this. What, what is going on, and how do they see the proper role of churches, and how do they see themselves as the ones who are able to dictate what is the proper role of churches? That's very disturbing. Uh, well, this is just amazing, Brad. And we're talking about the latest round of briefs that have been filed by the city in this case. we got a major hearing 
coming up toward uh, the end of the year that we expect to have significant effects on the outcome of this case. So the city has just filed one of their major briefs uh, in this case, and what they've said in those briefs is that when churches stray from their original purpose as houses of worship, whatever that's supposed to mean, then the city should be able to impose its own values on them through the public accommodations ordinance, through the employment ordinance, and even, Brad, a whole other aspect of this we haven't covered yet, an advertising restriction. Advertising restrictions. So, in other words, if a church is uh, involved in, uh, in carrying out what the Bible says with regards to the institution of marriage and, and morality and their employees being above reproach, as, uh, as it says in uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, we're looking at the city saying, aha, we're not going to let you advertise because you don't meet up to what we think you should believe and the values we think you should have? Yeah, well, Brad, uh, I think the free speech, the First Amendment implications of that should be pretty obvious. We hope uh, that they're clear to the court in this case. Yes. But they're not clear to the city. They, they just don't seem to get um, the far-reaching implications of what they're doing and really the far-reaching implications uh, that this case could have on other jurisdictions and the signals it could send across the country. Yeah, let's focus on that for a bit. Uh, I understand, Matt, that there are cities uh, in uh, other places, I heard like in Massachusetts, Iowa, that they're already trying to implement this this kind of an intolerant government control oppression uh, with regards to churches, religious institutions. Uh, we could see this spreading all across the country if we're not, we at Pacific Justice Institute are not successful in bringing this to a halt and stopping it. Uh, I mean, did that I'm really concerned about this, and I think that uh, many people out there listening to this program should be concerned as well. It's, yeah, there's a lot of reason to be concerned, Brad, because the, the city of De Pere there in Wisconsin wants to be the first to get a court to say that churches can be places of public accommodations subject to the city's control, the city's values, um, and that's that's what we're trying to head off here. Yeah, and there are so many cities uh, out there across the United States, uh, from San Francisco to New York uh, to Boston and Miami, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, I mean, they're all over, where they're dominated by city councilmen who do not have a real appreciation necessarily for people of faith, institutions of faith. I mean, that's my perception, and that's my concern. And I see this happening with regard to large cities, but also relatively small cities, just like DuPere. So people, folks, you need to be concerned, you need to be aware, you need to be praying for our work at Pacific Justice. And also, we have a special resource to help protect your churches on our website, is to help their bylaws so they can adopt bylaws, policies that will help protect them from litigation and some ordinances that may be coming down that we're like we're talking about today. So go to our website, download that for free, give that to your church. It's pji.org, pji.org. And once again, we appreciate those who support our work, both prayerfully as well as financially as well. And um, Matt, thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, keep it up. And I know many people across the country are going to be praying for you and the work of Pacific Justice Institute in this, in this very important case. Thank you, Brad, and, and thanks to every listener right now who who is supporting us in this. You got it. God bless. So, folks, there we have it. It's our God-given freedoms we're talking about. Now, let's choose to keep them. I'm Brad Dacus for the Pacific Justice Institute. Have a great weekend.